All right, so we're going into unit 11. Unit 11 is electromagnetism. Now, electromagnetism is largely based around Faraday's law, and Faraday's law itself is going to be based on a quantity called magnetic flux. Now, in physics, flux is a measure of how much field is passing through an area, and that could be any type of field. It could be gravitational field, electric field, but in this case, it's going to be magnetic field. And in order to have flux, you need to have, obviously, a field and an area for it to pass through. So here I have a solenoid, and the space between the loops here, that's our area. And flux is going to be based on two vectors, which is field and area. So it's obviously just an area. Area itself, it can be a vector. An area vector is a vector pointing normal, perpendicularly out of the surface. So that's an area vector. It comes out of the surface, normal to the surface. And I can pass a flux through here if I have a field going through it. So I have a magnet right here. The red end, that's the north end of the magnet. So magnetic field comes out of north. So if I orient it like this, I would have field going through the surface, and that would give me a flux because there's field passing through the surface. And flux itself is a measure of how much field is passing through the area. So if I had a stronger magnet, I'd have more field coming out of the magnet, and I would have a greater flux. If I had a bigger area, I would have more area to go through, so I'd have, um, I'd have more flux in that case as well. So 11.1 is just bas basically what is magnetic flux. It's a pretty short section. So we'll look at the definition of it, do a couple of easy questions, then we'll do a calculus question, and then that's it. So let's go ahead and do 11.1 on magnetic flux. So here's a magnet and a loop of wire. The area between the loop of wire is a 2D surface. And flux is going to be based on two vectors, which is the magnetic field and then the area vector. So an area vector is a vector that comes perpendicularly out of the area. So here's an example of one. Um, DA just means a small piece of the area vector. And this is a magnet. So we know the field comes out of the north pole. So the magnetic field would go like that. So you would have B go through the area. So we have the B vector passing through the area vector. That means that we have a flux. If I reverse the magnet, you know, now at the south pole, the magnetic field goes into the south pole. So in this case, I would have flux still of the same magnitude, but they'd be in the opposite direction. Now here, I wouldn't have any flux. So flux is how much field passes through a surface. So when the field vector, which would be B, and the area vector are perpendicular, then you have no flux. So magnetic flux is based on two vectors, the field vector B passing through an area, and then the area vector, which is either A if the field is uniform, or DA if you have to integrate because the field is changing. And it's defined as the dot product of those two vectors. Here's the formula in both the physics C form here on the left and the algebraic form over here. It says the magnetic flux phi sub b, b for magnetic flux instead of electric flux, equals the integral of b dot dA. Now, if the field is constant throughout the area, then it's just ba cosine theta. It's a dot product, so you know dot product is product of the magnitudes times cosine theta. Now, this formula probably looks familiar because remember, it's a formula for flux, which is the amount of field passing through a surface. In physics C, we've already done this, and that's for electric flux. So there's the formula for electric flux. If you see, it's basically the same formula, except for instead of magnetic field, we have an electric field. And something we don't really cover in physics C, but something that does exist, is gravitational flux. So there's gravitational flux. Gravitational field strength is G. If you integrate that over the air, you get gravitational flux. The units of magnetic flux. Well, let's look at the variables. We have field, which is measured in Teslas, and area, which of course is measured in square meters. So the units are Teslas times square meters, and there's a name for that. So one Tesla meter squared is one Weber. So Webers are the units of magnetic flux. So in magnetism, the role that Gauss's law of electricity plays in electrostatics is kind of taken by Ampere's law, but there is a separate law in magnetism that is Gauss's law, and it's still concerned with the flux through a Gaussian surface that encloses the source of the field. So here is a Gaussian surface enclosing this magnet. So it's a closed surface with the source of the field inside. And this Gaussian surface has some dA vectors coming out of it. And there is magnetic field going through these area vectors. So this is a magnet, so the field comes out of north and into south, like that. 
So if I look at the field vector and the area vector, if I look on the right side, I have the field vector passing through the right and the area vector passing outwards also to the right. But then on the left, I have the area vector coming outwards to the left, but the field is going towards south, so it's going to the right. And this is true for any field line. If I draw any field line going from north to south, the flux coming out of the north will cancel out the flux coming into the south. And the net result is, is that we have no net flux here. So mathematically, flux equals zero. And Gauss's law for magnetism says the total magnetic flux through any closed surface is going to be zero. The result of this is that there's no magnetic monopoles. Because if I had a magnetic monopole, let's say I had just a north pole, and I enclosed a Gaussian surface around it, well, then I would have a net flux, but that's not possible. And that's due to this law right here. Now, this equation here, Gauss's law for magnetism, this is one of Maxwell's equations. Remember, those are the four equations that unite electricity and magnetism. And this is one of them. Example A, a uniform magnetic field of 0.8 Teslas acts in the positive y direction, which on these axes is to the right. So I have the field acting directly to the right. And for the area, so it's passing through surface A, B, D, E, and we're trying to find the flux through surface A, B, D, E. And we want to find the dot products. We need an area vector for this surface. Well, the area vector is this vector right here. That's part of it. That comes perpendicularly outwards from the surface. And if you have a 3D shape, it's outwards from the 3D shape. So I have B and DA. They're in opposite directions. That means the flux is going to be negative because I'm doing the dot product. Dot product is BA cosine theta. Here, theta is 180 degrees. And there's our formula. When we plug in numbers, we get 0.8 times 3.5 times 4. That's the area of the shape. It's a rectangle. Hopefully you know the area of a rectangle. Times cosine 180 because they're in opposite directions. And there's our answer. It's negative. Again, they're in opposite directions. So we get a negative flux, 11.2 Weber's. Part B, this one's a bit weirder. Find the flux through surface A, B, C, F. That's that lateral surface. This is a, I think a right triangular prism. And that's sort of the lateral edge there. So again, the area vector comes perpendicularly out of the surface. And the dot product is B, A, cosine theta. Theta here is that angle between them, the angle between the two vectors. I don't really know what theta is, but using um, geometry, I know that cosine theta is 3 fifths. So there's plugging in numbers, and our answer is 8.4 Weber's. Example B, a uniform two Tesla magnetic field passes through a circular loop with a radius of 0.2 meters that has four turns. Calculate the flux through the loop. Now this question is pretty easy. The only thing to keep in mind is that there is four loops. So what that means is there's four areas. Remember flux is the amount of field going through an area. If I have four loops, then I have four areas for the flux to go through. So I have to multiply that flux by four. So here's the formula. It's revised a little bit with this n here. And n is just the number of loops because for each loop you have that flux n times. So it's a pretty easy question. We just plug in numbers. And there you go. We have four loops. We have the field of two Teslas. And each loop is a circle. So the area of a circle is obviously pi r squared. And the answer is about 1.005 Weber's. But to two sig figs, that's just one Weber. Example C, and this is definitely an AP Physics C level question because there's some calculus involved here. An infinitely long conducting wire has a current of I, and the wire itself has a distance of A from a rectangular loop with a width of W and height of H. Drive an expression for the magnetic flux through the rectangle. Now, what makes this complicated is the field through this rectangle is not constant. So if you use the right hand rule, you put your thumb in the direction of the current. And curl your fingers. Your current, your fingers are going to curl into the page through this loop. So we're going to have a field into the page. However, the field is going to be stronger here than it is here. So you have a variable field. So we're going to have to do some calculus here. So we're going to do that by breaking the loop into many different DAs, which are small pieces of area. So there's a DA, and again, this is calculus. We have infinitely many, infinitely small DAs going along the x-axis because the field. The field's going to vary with this into the wire, which is along the x-axis. So I'd have a DA here. I'd have one out here. You know, infinitely many along the x-axis. Now, each DA is going to have a thickness of DX. 
So it's going to have a really small, infinitely small thickness, which is dx, but it'll have a constant height of h. So the area of each dA is that constant height of h times its thickness, which is dx, because all these dA's are rectangles. And then each dA is going to be a distance of x from the wire. And x is going to be a variable, because if I have a dA over here, we're going to have another value of x, which is going to be larger. So x is going to be a variable here. And then as we go to the different dA's, there's going to be a field. And that field is variable, because again, x is a variable. And the field is the field due to a wire. We know the field due to a wire is mu sub 0 i over 2 pi r, where r is the distance to the wire. In this case, that is x. So this is not constant which means we're going to have to go and do some calculus. To evaluate the integral, the first step is to establish the bounds. So if you look at the dA's, they vary along the x-axis. x equals 0 is going to be at the wire. And then we start integrating where the loop starts, which is the left end of the loop, which is the distance of a from x equals 0. So that's our lower bound, a. And then the upper bound is the right end of the loop. So we have a to get to the left end, and then to the right end, we go additional w, the width of the loop. So upper bound is a plus w. So those are our bounds. Then we just have b dot dA. So b is mu sub 0 i over 2 pi x, where x is the variable here. And then dA, that's the small area there, which has a thickness of dx and a height of h. So thickness times height would be your area, which is h dx. Most of the things there are constants, so we'll pull them out of the integral sign. So we have mu sub 0 i times h over 2 pi. And then we just integrate from a to a plus w of dx over x. And of course, that integral is just going to be ln x. So we have mu sub 0 i times h over 2 pi times ln x evaluated from a to a plus w. When you plug in bounds, you get mu sub 0 i times h over 2 pi times ln quantity a plus w minus ln of a. If you know properties of logs, you know that log thing minus log thing is just log thing over thing. So phi, the final answer is going to be mu sub 0 times i times h over 2 pi times ln of the quantity a plus w over a. And that's the final answer. And a question like that is really in physics C the most common type of calculus-based magnetic flux question you're going to see. And that's 11.1. .1.